Hi, and welcome to the EDB Postgres Cloud Management 2.0 Technical Overview. I'm Ryan Shoemaker, Architect of Cloud Management. In this presentation, I will be providing you with an architectural overview of EDB Postgres Cloud Management 2.0 before moving through some of the OpenStack prerequisites for the product, followed by a summary of the installation and configuration steps required before using the product, and finally, a comprehensive demonstration of the product features. EDB Postgres Cloud Management automatically provisions PostgreSQL or EDB Postgres Advanced Server databases in single instances or high availability clusters. In minutes, Cloud Management configures a cluster of database machines with streaming replication, connection pooling, load balancing, automatic failover, encryption, user scheduled backups, point in time recovery, elastic storage, and elastic scale out. The cloud management platform is designed to help you easily create and manage high availability database clusters from either a web browser or a programmatic API. When you create a cluster, cloud management provisions one or more Postgres instances running within virtual machines and configures streaming replication to synchronize data within the cluster. It also configures PG pool to provide load balancing and connection pool for client applications. Cloud management configures all of the required cloud resources for the, for the cluster, such as virtual machines, elastic IP addresses, elastic storage, security, etc. The master node of the cluster contains a running instance of Postgres along with PG pool. Each of the cluster replicas also contains a running instance of Postgres in read only hot standby role. PG pool ensures that all database modifications are routed to the master node while load balancing all reads across the replicas. Cloud management automatically heals clusters in the event of node failures. Should a master node fail, it can either be replaced by a new master node, transferring the disk storage from the old master, or an existing replica can be promoted, which provides faster recovery time at the expense of potentially losing uncommitted transactions on the master. In the event a replica node fails, cloud management will automatically re replace it with a new replica. If you're already familiar with Postgres Plus Cloud Database, you might be wondering how Enterprise DB Postgres Cloud Management differs. The short answer is that they are largely feature equivalent. The primary difference is that PPCD provides a public cloud hosted solution on Amazon AWS, while EPCM provides a private cloud solution that is customer hosted on OpenStack. EPCM runs within a customer's private network. We will now take a look at the OpenStack prerequisites for hosting a cloud management console. Cloud Management 2.0 is supported on community OpenStack releases Icehouse, Juno, and Kilo, as well as RHEL OpenStack Kilo. The product has very few requirements in order to deploy on an OpenStack installation, all of which are related to OpenStack user accounts and privileges. The primary requirement is the creation of what we refer to as a service account. This is a special account within OpenStack that has been granted administrative privileges. Cloud management uses this account internally to manage all of the resources used by the database clusters it creates on behalf of end users, including virtual machines, elastic IPs, security groups, storage, etc. In order to expose an OpenStack project, via the EPCM console to EPCM end users, the service account must be added as an admin member of the project. In order to grant end users access to the CM console and API, their OpenStack user account must be granted member privileges in each project they require access to. If an OpenStack user has admin privileges within a project, they will automatically be granted admin privileges within CM for that project. Let's take a look at an example on the next slide. This slide is meant to represent a sample project membership within an OpenStack environment and how that affects what end users will see in the Cloud Management Console. We see three projects, A, B, and C. In red, you'll see the special service account that Cloud Management uses to manage resources within OpenStack, listed as a member and admin for projects A and B, but not C. This means that when end users log into the EPCM console, they will only be able to provision clusters in projects A and B, depending on their individual project memberships. For example, when user Alice logs into the CM console, 
she will have access to projects A and B with CM admin privileges in project A. When user Bob logs into the CM console, he will have access to projects A and B with CM admin privileges in project B. When user Chuck logs in, he will only have access to project A. Even though Alice and Bob both belong to OpenStack project C, they will not be able to provision clusters there because the special service account does not have admin privileges in that project. Let's take a look at some actual project membership in the OpenStack console. I'm going to log into our RHEL OpenStack server and navigate to the Identity tab. On this screen, you can inspect and edit settings on OpenStack projects and users. Let's first inspect the PPCD Dev project membership. Here we see the special OpenStack service account called PPCD Admin, with both admin and member privileges in this project. If we cancel out of this and look at the PPCD QA project, you will again see the service account PPCD Admin has both admin and member privileges. If we go back to the PPCD Dev project, you will see there are other members with and without admin privileges. Let's cancel out of this and go back to the QA project again. Again, we see a mixture of admin and non-admin members. Note that my personal account does not appear in this project's membership list, which means that I would not be able to provision or manage database clusters belonging to this project via the Cloud Management Console or API. In this section, I will move into a demonstration of how to install and configure Cloud Management. These are the steps a customer would have to perform before running the product. The cloud management product is currently being delivered as a virtual machine image that can be launched, configured, and available within minutes. The steps to do so include loading the image into OpenStack Glance, creating a security group with the necessary permissions to allow the console to run, launching an instance of the console, assigning a floating IP address, configuring the properties file, deploying the cloud management application, and finally performing some configuration of server images and DB engines. I've already gone through the process of importing the Cloud Management Console image into OpenStack. The process is fully documented in our admin guide. The next step is to create a security group with all the necessary permissions. To do that, navigate to the OpenStack project where you want to launch the Cloud Management Console image and click on the Access and Security tab. Then click the Create Security Group button to begin the process. Give the security group a name. And once it has been created, we can click on the Manage Rules button to begin adding permission. First, let's grant SSH access from any originating address. In a production environment, the customer may want to restrict access to very specific IP addresses. Next, we will allow inbound HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Inbound traffic on port 6666 and the port range 7800 to 7900, which is used by the JGroups library to communicate with all of the cluster node managers to collect cluster status information. At this point, you could optionally add a rule to allow inbound traffic on port 5432 if you want direct access to the Cloud Management Console database containing all of the state for the console and running clusters. To launch the console image in an instance, we'll navigate over to the Images tab and click the Launch Instance button to begin the process. Fill in the instance details including instance name and VM size.
Then navigate to the Access and Security tab and assign or create an SSH key and select the security group we created in the previous step. Finally, check the selected network for the virtual machine before hitting the launch button. After a few moments, you will see your console instance going through its build process. After the console is up and running, we can associate a floating IP address. At this point, it's worth it to take a quick look at the instance's console log. At the top, we see CloudInit injecting my SSH key for use by the CentOS user account, followed by service init logging from Postgres and the GlassFish application server. Now that the console instance is up and running, we need to SSH into it and configure the PPCD properties file. First, I'll copy the floating IP address associated with the console and use it to SSH in as user CentOS. Then I will switch to user PPCD and load the properties file in VI. This properties file is used to control several behaviors of the console, starting with all the information needed to access the local console database, including username, password, database name. We also include a default console DB backup script customers can use or replace with their own. Next up are various email settings the console will use when generating email. A customer would typically have dedicated email aliases set up for these groups. And here is the name of the container to use when storing wall files to support point-in-time recovery. If this container doesn't exist within OpenStack Swift, it will be created. Next is a timeout value in minutes that controls how long API tokens are valid. The remaining properties control access to the OpenStack backend. You need to specify a region, the name of the admin role, the identity endpoint used for authentication, and the credentials of the service account. Once the property file is configured, we can deploy the Cloud Management Console web application. It is important to note here that the GlassFish application server is meant to run under the PPCD user account. Deploying the app is simply a matter of running the asadmin deploy command on the WAR file. After a minute or so, we should see a successful deployment me message. And there it is. Now is a good time to check the GlassFish server log. There's nothing in here that I specifically want to call attention to, this is all normal startup logging. We are now ready to log into the Cloud Management Web Console for the first time. Let's copy the floating IP of the console instance and paste it into a web browser. Here's the login screen. I'll enter my OpenStack credentials. Because this is my very first time logging into the console, I'm asked to complete some user information, name and email address. I'm prompted for my password again before being allowed to modify the email address on the account. The last thing we have left to configure before we can start provisioning database clusters are server types and DB engines. Since I have admin privileges in the PPCD dev tenant, I'm able to configure these resources by clicking on the admin tab. First, we'll add a new server type, giving it a name and description. Then we'll have to switch over to the OpenStack dashboard and navigate to the images tab and find the correct image we want to use. I'm going to pick CentOS 7 image and click on it to see all the details. All we need from here is to copy the image ID and paste it back into the dialog on the Cloud Management Console. 
The initial user field is, is the user account configured by the person that created the virtual machine image that cloud management will use to log in and provision the node. In this case, it is the user CentOS. Click Save and we're done. This process can be repeated for each base VM image you want to allow end users to provision. I'll go ahead and add another one for CentOS 6. Down below, we see a list of partially configured DB engines for each of the eight supported combinations of CentOS 6 and 7, Postgres 9.4 and 9.5, and Advanced Server 9.4 and 9.5. These DB engines are disabled by default because they aren't paired with server types, and the Advanced Server engines require YUM repo credentials. Let's enable the Postgres 9.5 engine for CentOS 6 and 7. All we need to do is select the engine, pair it with the correct server type, and then enable it for use. Now that we've gotten through console installation and configuration, I'll be walking through a comprehensive set of feature demos. In this section, I will demonstrate most of the product features, including cluster creation, scale up, upgrade, backup, cloning, scaling of replicas, scaling of machine sizes, as well as cluster administration settings and deletion of clusters. Before running through each of these features, I'd like to start with a tour of the Cloud Management Web Console. In the top right corner, you will see a drop-down menu that lets the user pick which OpenStack tenant or project they want to provision and manage clusters in. There's also a logout button. From here, you can navigate to other tabs, including the Clusters tab, Backups tab, and User tab. Since my OpenStack user account has admin privileges in the currently selected tenant, I also have access to the two administrative tabs in the Cloud Management Console, the DBA tab and the Admin tab. When you log into the console, you begin on the Dashboard tab where you will find general information including a quick launch button for creating clusters, a brief summary of resource usage, a hot topics panel that contains the latest news from Enterprise DB, and finally a table of documentation in both PDF and HTML format. The Clusters Detail panel shows you all of the detailed information about clusters and provides all management features I'll be covering in the next section. I'll go into more detail about this panel in the next demo after we've created a new cluster. The Backups tab shows you detailed information about cluster backups. It also allows you to restore backups and delete them. The User tab allows end users to manage their personal information such as first and last name, company name, and notification email address. The User ID here matches the OpenStack User ID and is not modifiable. The DBA tab allows admin users to peek into the cloud management database via the web console. Most of the internal state of the cloud management console is exposed in a read-only view on this tab, with the exception of any sensitive information such as passwords or SSH keys. Again, this tab isn't very interesting right now because we haven't created any clusters. The admin tab allows ad admin users to create and manage the server types and DB engines we discussed in a previous demo. It also allows setting a wall message for all actively logged in users of the console. And finally, there is a button that allows the user to download a zip bundle of the console logs. Now let's move into the detailed feature demo starting with cluster creation. I'm going to click on the cluster details tab and then the create cluster icon. The dialog that opens up allows you to specify all of the settings for the new cluster. Let's first give it a name. The next option is selecting a DB engine. We'll go with Postgres 9.5 on CentOS 6 for this one. Next, we'll pick a server class. This is essentially the size of the virtual machine the cluster nodes will provision on. Different server classes have different resources available, such as the amount of RAM, number of CPUs, etc. Depending on how the backend OpenStack network is configured, you may have to select the appropriate virtual network and floating IP pool. The number of nodes controls how large the database cluster is. For now, we will create a single node cluster with one gigabyte of storage. 
There are additional options that allow you to encrypt the storage, perform a system yum update during provisioning, and control the username and password for the database. You may also assign a per cluster notification email address, which normally defaults to the email address of the user creating the cluster. On step two of the dialog, you can control backup related settings, such as backup retention, backup window, and whether or not to enable point in time recovery. Then we click the launch button and wait for the cluster to be provisioned. We can monitor this process in the cluster details panel. The top half of the page lists each cluster. The bottom half shows the cluster details for the currently selected cluster. The first step of the process is the creation of the cluster virtual machine instance in the OpenStack backend. A private IP address is assigned, which shows up in the bottom of the page. On the left, we see a summary of all the cluster details, creation date, database engine version, owner, storage size, etc. Once the virtual machine is up and running, a public floating IP address is assigned to the master node, and then the actual provisioning of the node begins. During this, the Cloud Management Console SSHs into the cluster node and performs all required configuration of the system, including installation of the DB and PG pool RPMs. The next steps are the creation of the data volumes, which will contain the data directory, followed by the creation of certificates, and finally the database server is started. The cluster health icons are indicated in the virtual machine, high availability, database, and update columns. In this case, the VM, HA, and DB columns are up and running healthy, but the yellow alert in the update column indicates that there are available YUM updates on this node. Now that the cluster is up and running, additional controls are available in the lower left pane that allow you to control the cluster healing mode, auto scaling thresholds, and backup settings. If we open the Monitoring Accordion tab, we can see graphs showing the historical activity within the cluster, such as disk usage, active database connections, and CPU load. It's not very interesting to look at now since the cluster just started up, but there is a dropdown that lets you pick the time range for the graphs. There is also a cluster events tab that shows important events in the history of the cluster. The entire cluster creation process took approximately six minutes from start to finish, but there are a number of factors that control how long this process can take. For the purposes of this demo and the following ones, I've sped up the screencast to skip over the long running processes. A single node cluster isn't very interesting, so let's scale up by adding a replica. I'm going to click on the scale up icon to begin the process. Select one replica in the first drop down menu. Let's also scale up the cluster storage while we're at it. I'm going to add two gigabytes. Then we click the Scale Up button and wait for the process to complete. The first thing that happens is the master node's data is increased by 2 gigabytes. This only takes about 10 seconds in real time. Then a new replica is created and provisioned. A snapshot of the master node's data volume is restored on the replica and streaming replication is configured. The entire scaling process took approximately seven minutes, and in the end, we're left with a new replica in the cluster and a total of three gigabytes of data storage available. The cluster upgrade button starts the process of updating all the database packages as well as system packages on the cluster nodes. We pop a notification dialog warning the user that this operation can take a long time depending on how out of date the nodes are. This operation is essentially equivalent to logging into each cluster node and running a sudo yum update. Because the yum update might contain critical security or kernel updates, the Cloud Management Console reboots each node. A full transcript of this operation is sent via email to the cluster notification address. As in any yum update, it is possible that there are package dependency issues that must be resolved manually by an administrator. In our case, the upgrade has completed successfully and we see the upgrade column change to a healthy green check mark. Creating a cluster backup is a simple process. First, select a cluster and then hit the backup icon. You can add a short note to describe the backup if desired. Then click the backup button. This is typically a very fast process because all we are doing is creating a snapshot of the data volumes in the OpenStack backend. If we navigate over to the Backups tab, you can see the backup we just created. 
Now let's go back to the Cluster Details tab and create a clone of the cluster. This operation creates a new single node cluster whose database is restored from a snapshot of another existing cluster. You can see from the clone dialog that you also have the ability to change some of the properties of the cloned cluster if you choose. Note that the update column shows a yellow alert. This is because only the data volumes are cloned, not the entire virtual machine. Cloud Management started a brand new virtual machine using the same slightly out of date virtual machine image we used in the initial cluster, which is why it comes up with the yellow alert. Scaling down a cluster is a very easy task. Simply select the cluster, click the scale down button, and then select the replica you wish to remove before confirming the dialog. Within a few seconds, you can see that cloud management begins shutting down the replica and virtual machine. The machine scaling dialog allows you to scale the virtual machine size of your cluster nodes up or down as your needs grow or shrink. Unlike the cloning operation, the machine scaling operation modifies the selected cluster rather than creating a new cluster. New nodes are launched of the new machine size to replace the old nodes. You can confirm the new VM size in the cluster details panel at the end of the process. At any point in time, you can change the ownership and notification address of a running cluster. Simply select the cluster and then click the Cluster Admin Settings icon. From here, you can reassign the cluster to another user within the currently selected tenant and or change the email notification address. These provide you with the flexibility to reassign resources within a department from one user to another. To delete a cluster, select it and then click the Delete Cluster icon. You will be prompted for confirmation and also be given the opportunity to release the cluster's floating IP address. Once you confirm the delete, you can monitor its progress in the Cluster Details panel. And finally, I'm going to demonstrate how to gain SSH access to a database cluster. After selecting the cluster, click on the Download SSH Key icon. You will need to allow pop-ups in your browser for this feature to work correctly. The cluster's unique SSH key will automatically be downloaded by the browser, and you will see an informational dialog explaining how to use it. The first step is making sure that the key has the proper file permissions. Let's run Chmod 600 on it. Now we can copy the SSH command from the dialog and run it in a terminal. You can see that the connection is not successful and eventually will time out. The reason for this is that cloud management does not leave the SSH port open on cluster nodes by default. SSH access is allowed from very specific addresses assigned to the cloud management console and other nodes within the cluster. To allow access, we need to modify the security group within OpenStack. After logging in, navigate to the Project tab, and then Access and Security. Then find the appropriate security group for your cluster, and click the Manage Rules button. From here, we can add a new SSH rule. I'm going to leave the rule open to all traffic, but in practice you may want to only grant SSH access to very specific IP addresses. Now when we retry the SSH command from our terminal, we are able to log right in. And finally, a few short demos of features available to cloud management admin users, including configuration of server types and DB engines, the DBA tab, and OpenStack resource usage. So what is a server type? 
A server type is simply an encapsulation of the information needed by cloud management to launch virtual machines within OpenStack, including name, description, image ID, the cloud init user. In this case, we see a CentOS 6 VM specified by its OpenStack image ID. The base server types used by cloud management to provision database cluster nodes have few requirements. Basically, any CentOS or RHEL, Linux 6 or 7 image will do. It can be a vanilla installation of the operating system or it can be customized by the customer. It must have a cloud init user with sudo su minus privileges in order for cloud management to be able to SSH in and bootstrap provision the cluster nodes. So what is a DB engine? A DB engine is simply the pairing of metadata for a specific version of Postgres along with a server type. In the screenshot below, you can see a Postgres 9.5 engine paired with a CentOS 6 server type. When a user chooses to provision a database cluster using this DB engine, cloud management will spin up the appropriate CentOS 6 VM and then provision the listed PostgreSQL YUM packages on it. Cloud management currently ships with support for Postgres 9.4.9.5 and Advanced Server 9.4 at 9.5. These DB engines can be paired with multiple server types as needed by the customer. Cloud management administrative users have access to the DBA tab which provides a read-only view into the console database. From here, users can inspect most of the information stored in the database, such as attached data volumes, backups, DB engines, cluster instances, node statistics, which are used to monitor the health of cluster nodes, and also to plot the graphs on the monitoring tab, cluster event history, server images, and snapshots. Let's jump back into the OpenStack dashboard and take a look at how some of the database cluster resources are allocated in the back end. First, we'll make sure that we have the correct OpenStack project selected and then navigate to the Project tab and then the Instances tab. In addition to the Cloud Management Console instance itself, we can see a database cluster instance running and its associated floating IP address. The instance virtual machine size and SSH key pair are also shown. If we take a quick look at the volumes and volume snapshots tab, you'll see some of the volumes and snapshots created by the cloud management console. A peek inside the OpenStack Swift object store shows the container used for storing all of the wall segments needed to support point in time recovery. While we're in the OpenStack dashboard, we can also review the project limits in general. The main project page has various pie charts showing resource usage within the project. During some cluster operations, you may receive an error message on the Cloud Management Console that a resource limit is preventing the operation from continuing. Should that happen, you can navigate to the Identity tab and then select Modify Quotas next to your project. The resources you are most likely to run out of are volumes, snapshots, security groups, and especially security group rules. You should work with your OpenStack administrator to ensure that you have enough resources available for end users to provision database clusters. This concludes the technical overview of Enterprise DB Postgres Cloud Management 2.0. Cloud management allows you to offer an elastic and highly scalable database as a service within a private cloud environment. The product can be installed, configured, and launched with minimal configuration and is designed to let you easily create highly available database clusters in minutes, not days or weeks. The feature-rich console allows users to quickly and easily create and manage clusters with many powerful built-in features such as automatic cluster healing, scaling and backup, streaming replication, connection pooling, and load balancing, elastic scaling of storage replicas and server class, point-in-time recovery, and secure data encryption. I hope you found the presentation and demos helpful. Thank you.